Welcome everyone uh, to the HDF Cloud Beta call. Really appreciate uh, all of you taking the time to jump on this quick call and for first of all signing up and uh, spending a little bit of time with us to learn more to, about this great new program we have. So first, my name is Dave Pera. I'm the CEO. I like to say I'm still the new CEO, but I've been around for around 18 months. Joined the uh, middle of last year, and this is a program that we've actually have been working on for the last couple of years. So this is all part of our initiative to take the great community that we have and users with HDF and build on it and provide things of value to the community. Because it's really without the community, we wouldn't be here in the position that we have to help serve science users, other folks in research, and, and other areas. So we take that commitment very seriously and look forward to uh, launching new products, including but not limited to uh, HDF Cloud, which you're going to learn about here. Uh, but first, I just wanted to kind of set the stage. A lot of our users have asked us, you know, what we're going to be doing uh, with cloud technologies. And sometimes when we hear that, they actually just mean on-prem web services. Sometimes that means object storage without the web services piece. And sometimes it means what I traditionally think of is, you know, a combination of remote cloud turnkey services like AWS or Azure and uh, the related cloud you know, object storage technologies. And so part of what we wanted to do here is make sure as we're developing this solution that we have really early feedback from you, our users, who are interested in this and what particular aspect of the cloud platform you're looking for. So the initial release, like the beta is, is going to be on AWS, so Amazon Web Services. However, we anticipated and got early feedback that folks want to run it on other platforms or on-prem or without object storage. So these are things that we've, we've really optimized for in the way we've done our packaging and build. So we're really interested in getting feedback on folks who are interested in seeing us do this in Azure, Google Compute, some sort of private or hybrid cloud platform as well. And after the webinar, um, we're going to be sending you a link to, if you're interested, the beta user agreement. And basically what it does is it allows us to set you up with an account so you can upload a little bit of data, tool around with it, check out the API, check out the Jupyter Notebooks. We obviously are going to provide some technical documentation, and John's going to provide some minimal support. But given that John's a really scarce resource, you know, for folks, and we've done an alpha version of this, some of those folks were completely self-sufficient, and others really wanted us to walk them through more of the process and do ETLs of large batches of files for those folks. We can certainly do a very small engagement with you where we just basically bill on an hourly basis. But frankly, we're not trying to make money doing this. What we're trying to do is get feedback from you on are we building the right solution for the needs of the community? And that's really what our primary focus is. So your feedback is really critical, both today on the phone call and then as you use the product. It's the absolute uh, key to us ensuring we're building something of value. And with that, I want to throw it over to John Reedy, who really is the perfect person because he's has experience at both Intel and AWS. He was one of the early engineers on AWS at Amazon and joined the HDF group to kind of really bring HDF technology and cloud technology together. And so he's really one of those rare folks that's well positioned to understand both of those worlds. And with that, I will turn it over to you, John. Sorry, I had a little bit of a problem with my mute button. Um, hey, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm going to run through some slides uh, about the cloud server. And I'd encourage you to ask questions as they come up in the, the little questions panel. And uh, after that, uh, we will do a demo. And then we'll talk uh, briefly about uh, how you guys get started on the beta. Okay, um, so uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, I, I previously worked at Amazon, and even before that, I worked at Intel, where I used HDF5. 
And uh, it's kind of nice to be able to link back uh, some of those technologies I used earlier in my career uh, now in this cloud context. So uh, I presume most of you are familiar with HGF5. Um, it, what it is kind of depends on your point of view, right? You can think of it as a C API, as a file format, as a data model, but however you see it, it's proven to be in a very effective way to organize uh, large and complex data sets. Uh, some of the features, HF5, uh, support for multidimensional data. You have your metadata and data stored in one place. Uh, it's portable. Um, you can have both the logical and storage views of data. Uh, you have filter pipelines, compression, and a large ecosystem. There are literally hundreds of GitHub projects that depend on HF5 in one way or the other. And now we have the spinning wheel of oh, goodness. So we would like to bring this good stuff into the cloud. Uh, and you may ask, you know, what's this whole cloud thing about and why should we care? Um, the cloud can provide a very cost-effective infrastructure. The, the benefit of the cloud is that you pay as you go rather than paying upfront for what you anticipate you may need. Uh, there's lower overhead because you don't have the hardware set up, uh, sysadmins, etc. And furthermore, there are some cloud-based technologies that can really be helpful in the HF5 context. Uh, for one, is this idea of elastic compute. If we can scale the uh, compute dynamically, that enables us to have very effective uh, usage where we can grow the amount of compute as needed and have both uh, infinitely elasticable compute and lower uh, costs because when you're not doing stuff, you can bring down uh, the amount of compute resources. Object-based storage is a big part of uh, how we've architected uh, the HF cloud. And the benefit here is that you have a very low-cost storage platform uh, that also has building redundancy. So using AWS S3, uh, they do double copies of every byte of data that's written to it. So it's almost unheard of to lose any storage. And uh, there's a community platform, right? So this has potential to bring together uh, folks from different organizations around a common platform and set of data. So most public clouds, uh, again, are pay per usage, right? So we pay as you go pricing. And when we're thinking about HCM Cloud, we want to think about the major cost drivers. Uh, one, obviously, is storage. Uh, and we'll talk about the different storage technologies. Uh, next slide. And the other is compute. Uh, again, if we can have a last of compute, that will lower the overall cost of the compute aspect. Uh, and the third is egress charges. Uh, so these cloud vendors are very cagey. Uh, your data is free to come in, but you pay to bring it out. So if we can enable an architecture that allows uh, both efficient uh, egress in terms of limiting the amount of bytes that go out and also the ability to run compute on the AWS platform, we lower those egress charges. Uh, here's a, a table of uh, some of the common storage technologies provided by AWS. Um, this is kind of going from cheap to more expensive. All right, so on the cheap side, we have Glacier, which is basically tape archive. And if you had a petabyte of data and you stored it for one year in Glacier, it would cost you $125,000. And that seems, you know, I paint point of view, you know, pretty cost effective. Uh, but the downside of Glacier is that anytime you want to read anything out of Glacier, there is a four hour latency to read that first byte. Uh, so that's not really good if we want something that will allow interactive access to any data you have. Uh, there's another uh, S3 variant called S3 infrequent access, 
uh, that would cause a little more than glacier. Uh, but there, if you read the fine print, you are charged for data retrieval, and that may be a negative. Uh, then we come to S3, which in my view is kind of the sweet spot. Uh, you have a cost of $289,000, uh, and basically you can use it as much as you want, right? Um, if you're running the client where the S3 bucket is located, you're paying just a request cost of one cent per 10,000 requests. So 10,000 reads cost one penny. And as long as you don't move that data out of Amazon, you don't pay the egress charges. Okay, uh, moving up, we have EBS. Uh, think of EBS as uh, kind of like an attached uh, hard drive that you uh, connect to your EC2 instance. Here, the cost would be uh, considerably more, $629,000, plus it doesn't have the automatic backup capability, plus that data can only be accessed from that given EC2 instance. Whereas S3, once you're data in S3, it can be accessed from anywhere. Uh, next, we have EFS, which is a sort of NFS for AWS. Uh, here, the nice thing is you have the ability to have uh, what you think of as a POSIX shareable drive uh, that can be used by multiple computers. The downside is now our costs have gone up to $3.7 million. So 10 times uh, at least more expensive than S3 storage. Uh, similarly, we have DynamoDB, which is non POSIX, but is a, an impressively scalable database technology. Again, though, your costs would be on the order of $3 million. So let's introduce the highly scalable data service uh, HSDS, which is the core of the HDF Cloud platform. It's a RESTful interface to HDF5 using object storage. Uh, again, with S3, we have built-in redundancy, it's cost-effective, and has very scalable throughput. Uh, by that, I mean no matter how many clients you have connected uh, to your S3 storage bucket, your, your throughput will scale to the number of clients. The service itself runs as a cluster of Docker containers. Uh, these can either be on one physical instance or across a cluster of instances. Uh, it's feature compatible with the HF5 library, meaning uh, ideally every feature in HF5 we support in the data service. Since we are still in the process of uh, filling out all the features of the service, uh, that's not quite true at this point, but that is a goal. Uh, by the end of the project. The service itself is implemented in Python using async IO, uh, which enables a, a task-oriented parallelism. Uh, with async IO, whenever code is waiting on an external uh, event, like a, a read from S3, the server can do other uh, work uh, and not just wait there for that IO. Uh, so features of HSDS, clients can interact with a service using the REST API. Uh, there are SDKs that provide language for the interfaces, uh, for example, H5PyD for Python. They can read and write just the data they need, as opposed, say, to downloading an entire file and reading that locally. There's no limit to the amount of data that can be stored by the service. Um, multiple clients can be reading and writing to the same data source at the same time. And there's scalable performance. Uh, one way we get performance is to cache recently accessed data into RAM on the server. And the other is that we parallelize requests across multiple nodes, and we'll go into that uh, in a bit. And finally, we can grow the number of nodes uh, to scale performance to meet the load. So I mentioned it's RESTful. Uh, what is RESTful? Well, it's a client-server model. It's stateless, meaning that there's no client context that's stored on the server. It's cacheable, meaning that if you have a request, you can say the response, and that response will be valid. Um, it's basically every request is context-free, right? So that request 
makes sense in and of itself. If you have requests to read a civic section of civic data set, that request can run anytime, anywhere, and you'll get the same response, assuming the data hasn't been updated. All resources are identified by URIs and use the standard HTTP methods and behaviors of get and post and put and delete and so on. Here's uh, an example of a, a request, right? So request, HTTP request is just simply like text that you write into a, a socket and you, you put stuff in and you get, hopefully get a response out. Here we've done a post request that will create a new data set. So there are some uh, HTTP headers like the authorization has the user initials encoded. The host we use to identify the file uh, that the data set will create in. And you can use the accept, say I want to have binary response or text response. And then finally we have a JSON snippet that's saying that I want the data set to be uh, 10 elements and I want the type to be a 32-bit little Indian float. And you send that to the server and it comes back and says 201 created and you get back some stuff and a JSON snippet that has the ID of the newly created data set and some other information about that data set. So that's basically, uh, you know, this plus the many, many other uh, requests supported by a server can be used to either create or read uh, any type of HDF5 data. Okay, next let's talk about the challenge of going from the traditional HF5 model of uh, using POSIX-based file storage to object storage. Okay, A, one challenge is it's not POSIX, all right? So all the code that's using the typical POSIX functions no longer works. The other challenge is that the, each request has relatively high latency compared to doing uh, typical POSIX IO. The third challenge is that S3 is not read-write consistent. If you write 42 to S3 and then read it back right away, you may not get 42. You may get whatever value was previously uh, in that object. Uh, so the service has to be aware and, and, and overcome this lack of read-write consistency. Uh, high throughput uh, is possible, but you need some tricks. Uh, for example, the async uh, request that we use in the server. And you have to be mindful of the request charges. Uh, depending upon how the server is architected, if you wind up with many, many, many small objects, those request charges, even though they're very small in isolation, could add up to be significant. So our big idea here is that we're going to take the objects in your ordinary HFI file the data sets, the groups, the chunks, and store each of those as a separate storage object in S3. We're going to limit the maximum storage object size so that any one request will not take an unduly long amount of time to read. We're going to support parallelism for reading and writing. Uh, only the data that's modified needs to be updated. So if you're updating one chunk, we're not going to update the entire file. We're only going to update that one chunk and we're gonna support multiple clients to be re-updating that same file. And how we do this is that um, if I imagine this grid is a data set and I've divided it into these uh, regular regions called chunks, we'll store each chunk as an S3 object. And the service is uh, designed in such a way that it will size the chunks that uh, there'll be roughly one to two megabytes in size. Uh, so each of these chunks gets stored as an object. And now when we're doing, say, a read of this data set, for example, this yellow region, that yellow region will map into this case, six different objects stored in S3. And the service will do the work of uh, figuring out each of those objects, reading them, pulling apart the data needed by that client, assembling it together, and sending it back to the client. Uh, let's talk about the client-server architecture briefly. Uh, on the right, we have the service that supports our REST API. And on the left, 
there are different ways uh, a client could interact with a service. Uh, for example, you could have, say, a Ajax web app running in a browser and it's sending back and forth uh, Ajax calls to the service. You could have a, uh, well, we have a, a REST file, which is a plugin of sorts to the HF5 library. And now your existing C and Fortran applications that are using HF5 library can do all the same stuff they did before, but rather than going to a file on disk, it's going to, it's being converted to REST calls are going to the service and the content is being created on S3. And then uh, down here, we have uh, the Python SDK that similarly is taking the common H5Py interface, converting those requests to REST calls, sending those to the service and getting back the response. Uh, and again, any Python application that uses H5Py is easily updated to use H5PyD and do all the same stuff, but now it's running in the cloud. And finally, we have command line tools, which we'll talk about later, which are simple applets that let you do common things like upload or download files to the server. Uh, here's a little bit more about the architecture. Um, as we mentioned, the service runs as a set of nodes. There are two types of nodes. There are service nodes and data nodes. The service nodes take requests from the client. So we have a client here in yellow. It sends a request that gets uh, picked up by a load balancer and the load balancer distributes those requests to uh, randomly to one of the service nodes. This setup allows um, the service to handle any number of requests by expanding the number of service nodes it can take up the load from either a client who's saying last request or multiple clients that are sending requests. The service nodes don't directly read or write to S3. Instead, they send re multiple requests to data nodes. And the data nodes each own a partition of the S3 bucket where the data is stored. In this example, we have four data nodes and our S3 bucket is partitioned into four segments. So each data node is responsible for its own segment of the bucket. And that means that the data node can be the authoritative source of the data in any particular object. And this is how we get around the read-write inconsistency issues of S3, because any update to any object goes to the same data node, and that data node always understands the current state of that object. The other advantage of this architecture is that it allows a degree of parallelism. If we have, um, as in this example, a request that's spending multiple chunks, the service node multiplexes that incoming request to multiple requests to multiple data nodes. And this means that each data node is responsible for just a subset of the chunks needed for that read or write. It can do uh, the read from S3, the uncompressing of data, the segmenting of data, uh, all in parallel with the other data nodes. So if you have a request that spans 100 chunks and you're running 100 data nodes, each chunk can be read uh, just by one data node and then the results are amalgamated together and returned to the client. Okay, uh, next let's talk about uh, some of the different clients in more detail. Uh, H5PyD is the Python client for HDF server. Uh, it's probably the most popular uh, Python interface to HDF5. Uh, there's also PyTables, and uh, what I've done with H5PyD, though, is to take some of the query uh, interfaces and PyTables and graph that on to the H5Py API. So we have the best of both H5Py and Py tables. Uh, it's pure Python, uh, so there's no uh, HF5 library involved. Uh, it's compatible with H5Serve, which was a reference edition of the REST API we did earlier. And it includes several extensions to H5Py for features that don't have equivalents uh, in the HF5 library. For example, to list contents in folders, uh, to get instead ACLs, which are ways in which you can control who has uh, access to what objects, 
uh, and as I mentioned the PyTables like query interface. There's the HF res file, which will let you take any C application using HF5, flip a switch, and now have it read and write to the server. This is still in development, but we're expecting to have a beta out shortly. And we have the HSDS CLI command line interface tools. So if you think about it, um, you do a lot of things with regular HFI files that don't really have an equivalent on the cloud. Uh, for example, there's no HFI library function to delete an HFI file because you would just use the POSIX uh, function or uh, on a shell just do RM that file. Uh, you don't have that uh, in the cloud. So we create a set of tools that emulate some of these common operations you might like to do. There is HS info, will give you kind of a basic status info on the server. HSLS will list the contents in a folder or a file. HS touch will create a folder or a file. HS del will delete a file. HS load will upload an HFI file from your local system to the server. HS get will download a, a file from the server to a local HFI file. And HS ACL will let you create a list or modify the ACLs in a file. And uh, I'll have some examples of this in a minute. Um, as I said, we are uh, still in progress of filling out all the features. Um, things that we have not yet done yet, uh, but we will be working on, are support for variable length types, uh, support for dimension scales, support for the NetCDF library, uh, auto scaling. Auto scaling will be where the server number of nodes increases or, or contracts dynamically. And we'll be doing a lot of scalability and performance testing. We'd like to thank NASA who's supporting this project under Access Grant 15-0031. Uh, here I've listed some links uh, for more information. And these are uh, some links to places you can go for questions. And uh, now I'd like to kind of transition to uh, instead of talking about the service, let's, let's demo uh, some things. So we've been working, uh, besides NASA, we've been working with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And they came to us, they have uh, 50 terabytes of data that's a result of an HBC uh, simulation of uh, the weather over the continental U.S. for a period of seven years. And there are many people who would like to have the ability to access this data. Uh, example, if you're going to put a wind farm somewhere, it'd be interesting, right, to see which locations had the best uh, average wind. But it's pretty impractical uh, to have clients downloading the entire 50 terabytes to access. So we worked with NREL to put this data into the HSDS service, stored in S3, and now what we have is a data set that covers uh, the continental US, the time granularity is one slice per hour, the, uh, the geographical resolution is two kilometers per element, the data covers seven years, so that's uh, 61,368 slices, and there are approximately 27 million objects stored in the S3 bucket used by this uh, quote file. Um, so now users have the ability using the service to access any particular elements of this data collection they will see fit, and we'll show a interactive uh, Python notebook that shows how this works. All right, so let me hop out of PowerPoint. Uh, first, let me show the command line tools that might give a better flavor. So I'm running this on my desktop, but there's a configuration file that points to a particular um, EC2 instance running on AWS uh, that's running the server, that's connected to the bucket, that stores the data. If I type HS info, it'll show me my endpoint, uh, the server name, the server state, uh, ready, uh, who I am, my password, the server version, 
how long it's been up and the H5 PyD version I'm using. If I do HS lists, and I'll just give a path to my home folder, I see content on that folder. So this, even though it looks like a Unix path, the slash home slash John isn't something I've mounted to my desktop. It's just a, a abstract folder path that's managed by the server. Uh, there's a file here called tall.h5, and if I do hslists uh, home john tall.h5, I'll see there's two groups. And if I do dash r, I'll see there's actually a whole hierarchy of uh, groups and data sets and links and so on. If I do dash r dash v, I'll see more information about the objects. And if I do, um, there's an option to show kind of log details, log level debug. And here it's interesting because uh, as the HSLS is interacting with the server, we get to see the actual REST requests that are going out. They're going from my client uh, to the server and response is coming back. So we'll say, you know, get uh, server endpoint, groups, this group ID, uh, and links. And finally, I mentioned ACLs. Um, you can see the ACLs for this particular file with the show ACLs option. And uh, first we have the, the two groups again, and I'll show you there's an ACL called default. And that means that anyone can read this file, uh, but only the user named John can do either create, read, update, delete, uh, read the ACL or modify the ACL. So using the uh, update ACL tool, we can create additional ACLs for other users or change the values of these ACLs and so on. So uh, for the beta, we'll, we'll have a common server uh, storing data to a common S3 bucket for all the bay users. And by default, when you create a file, it'll be readable by the public, but writable only by you. Uh, if you want your data, say, to be more confidential, uh, you could modify the ACL so that only you would have read access to it. Okay, now let me switch to a Python notebook uh, that's using the H5 PyD. Uh, so this is, again is the um, kind of demo of the uh, data we imported for NREL. Uh, if you're not familiar with Python, uh, don't worry. I think um, it's, it, it'll be fairly self-explanatory. And the same kind of patterns would be used um, using the RESTful or other APIs. So we have the import h 5 pyd that just brings in uh, the package that we're using. And now I'm going to open a file. So here the path is slash nrel wtk-us.h5. And I got a file handle. There's a file ID, which is actually the ID of the root group of this file. And there is uh, a set of attributes attached to the file, uh, which is, has an attribute called history. And if I do f.adders uh, bracket history, I get to see that attribute, which says it's a text and says produced by three tier Inc under NREL subcontract, blah, blah, blah. So think about this. We have this file that's 50 terabytes and I can quite easily pull out you know, this, this little attribute uh, that's giving me some tidbit of information uh, about some aspect of this data collection. Uh, if I do list F, I'll see all the data sets in the file. There are a bunch of data sets for pressure, temperature, wind direction, wind speed, and so on. So let's pull out one particular data set. And this has uh, ID, which is D dash blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I have a note here. Uh, if this is an int, then you're using H5Pi, not H5PyD. 
meaning that uh, all the same code would work exactly the same way if I was using H5Py with a local HFI file. It might be a challenge to have a 50 terabyte uh, local file, but in principle, it would work exactly the same way. So let's get the shape. Let's look at those dimensions of this data set. So it's uh, 61, 3, 6, 8 in the first dimension. That's the time series dimension. And then we have uh, things that map to latitude and things that map to longitude. Uh, the data type is a float32. And the chunk layout is uh, 2489186. So that means that each, um, each object, sort of H3, represents a 24 by 89 by 186 piece of this larger data set. If I calculate the size of this data set, it's approximately one terabyte. So the dimensions times the size of a float32. And each slice is approximately 18 megabytes. Um, the file includes a, a data set called daytime, which is kind of like a map of um, the, the time as, as a string to what slice it is. So if I say take randomly slice 52400, I can do a read of that daytime data set at that timestamp, get back a string, and I'll format it uh, a little bit nicely. So we see that is the year 2012, December 23rd at 8 a.m. If I change this time slice to something else, let's say here, it'll be that date. Um, next, okay, let's read um, a slice of this data set. Uh, so I'll take that time step and I'll take every eighth element. And I put a percent time, that'll just give us like a, a readout on how long this will take. So that took 12 seconds. Um, that was a little slow uh, because it had to read the data initially from, from S3. And again, we're only running this uh, currently on one EC2 instance. As we scale up the number of nodes, the read performance will be faster. But let's try it again with that same volume. And now the time's improved to 4.58 seconds because now it's cached that data into RAM on the data nodes. And so it didn't need to go back to S3 to refetch that data again. Now that we have the data, let's uh, do a little plot. And we see there's a nice, um, if you squint, it's kind of like the continental US and it has the wind velocities uh, mapped to colors. Now I can take that same time step and I can zoom in on a subregion of the data set. And here it was much faster because the one, the data, the chunk data was already resident in the data nodes. And two, we needed to move less data from AWS down to my notebook for display. And there is a, a image of the zoomed in area. So this is you know, extracting data, um, keeping time fixed and looking at certain geographical extent. Let's flip that and now pick a certain latitude and longitude and we'll want to extract all the values for the entire seven year range. And this code seems a little complicated. I'll explain it in a second. So I'm running and it's going to do a, um, basically a series of requests to a server and given the responses, uh, kind of add those together to a longer time series. So now we have the 61,368 elements. Uh, I can plot that and I can zoom in to a subregion of that plot. And so here we see like the, the wind speed just varying hour by hour 
through that data set. Okay. Um, the reason here that the code had to be a little more complicated is that the server does have a constraint that if you try to access too many chunks, the server will say, hey, I can't, I can't process that many chunks. Um, so if I say instead of 8,000, I say extent and try to get the entire uh, 63,000 in one request, the server is going to give back a response of uh, 413, request and too large. So this happens in cases where you are requesting a read that's crossing hundreds of chunks and the server will, will give you this response and then you'll need to uh, kind of format your request to select a smaller area and then uh, sequentially read the chunks that you need and uh, through mobile requests assemble the larger data response. Okay, uh, so that's it for the demo. Let's see if we have any questions that come in. I see Chris Stoner is asking, uh, is it possible to subset a file using HDF5? Um, do you mean like to download a subset of a file or do you mean to have requests that's requesting a subset of a file. Hey John, this is Lori. Hey. So Chris Hi. said correct to download. Uh, not uh, not currently as part of the hsget tool. Uh, naturally, you could write your you know equivalent Python code that would download any portion of the file you need. Um, the, uh, that might be a feature we add uh, to a future rev of the uh, HSGET tool. Okay, we have another question. Are B trees used to index chunks as in classic HDF5? No. Um, in some ways, you know, it, it's easier uh, with uh, the using the S3 because um, Amazon's taking care of that hard part, right? Uh, once we know the ID, say, of a data set, all we need to do is send that request to S3, and uh, those smart guys at Amazon are doing the, the stuff to efficiently find that object and return to us. So we don't need to do, uh, you know, kind of complicated logic to manage space within a file as with the HF5 library. You know, um, like one common issue with the library is um, if you delete a data set, that leaves a hole in the file, right? So you've, 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 you've removed that data set, but you haven't shrunk the file, right? Unless you run repack or something to, to kind of manually uh, compress the file. So um, with S3, you don't have that issue, right? Because as soon as you delete something, it's gone and, and there's no uh, holds to speak of. I see we have some more questions. Uh, Kumar asks, please briefly mention about applications and flight data monitoring. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't know uh, much about flight data monitoring, uh, but I, I will say that, um, you know, one possible application that I think would be interesting to explore is to have, um, you know, a system where, say, you have multiple uh, physical sensors, and these sensors are sending data updates continuously to the server. And because a server supports multiple writers, you could have all these sensors firing off at the same time and the server serving as an aggregation point for these different streams of sensor data. Uh, question is, uh, do you use a database to map dimensions? 
Uh, no, we, we don't. Um, each data set has a, um, you know, a JSON object that describes the dimensions of that data set. So when you do a data set read, you're not getting all the data for a data set, you're getting a JSON snippet that describes that data set, uh, namely the, the type and dimensions of the uh, data space. Uh, when the chunks are stored in S3, uh, there's a server internally uses convention to name those objects so that they can efficiently be accessed again. Uh, Ted Haberman is asking, is flight data monitoring, monitoring the atmosphere the plane is flying through or monitoring the plane? Uh, so Laurie, maybe you can find from uh, Kumar if that's the case or not. Uh, Kumar is also saying, thanks. I've heard that there is open source software Polaris using HF5. I will go and explore. Yes, uh, Kumar, uh, please do and uh, let us know what you find out. Uh, Julian uh, says, uh, time series data is what I'm most interested in. Is it possible to index data sets using a data time column? Would it be interesting to see some query performance comparisons to popular time series? Yes, um, so like in the demo, um, the data sets were organized so that each hour just followed the, the indexes uh, of the data set. So it was kind of a, a transparent uh, to map a, a certain time series to the data set region you needed. Um, it actually turned out the original data was not like that, it was, it was shuffled. Uh, so you would need, if your data was formatted like that, you would need to have a, a data set that mapped the uh, time values to the indices, and then you might use something like point selection uh, to read the particular values you need. Okay. All right, uh, Laurie, do we have any more questions? I think I've covered all the ones I see in my... Uh, we do have a few more, um, and I'm passing them to you. Uh, Kumar said it was analyzing previously recorded data. That's on the, the flight okay. recordings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I should mention that, um, you know, if uh, if anyone has a particular use case in mind, uh, we'd be happy to discuss that. I, I think we'd probably uh, get more progress, you know, doing that kind of uh, thing one-on-one -on -one, uh, than we would in a group presentation. And uh, Thomas Caswell says, can H5 Pi talk to more than one HSDS instance at once? Uh, yes. Each, each request talks to one instance, um, but the, the functions have a parameter that specifies the endpoint, so if you use that parameter, you could direct the endpoint uh, to whichever server you needed at the time. Okay, another question. What was the biggest surprise you found when you built this tool? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the, um, the NREL project was very helpful because uh, that uh, exposed uh, scaling challenges that we maybe didn't appreciate uh, going into the project. Uh, so that was a really good validation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different, uh, you know, thing once you go from dealing with you know, files that are hundreds of megabytes to, to uh, tens of terabytes in size. And so uh, that was surprising that it really uncovered 
uh, some issues that uh, we may not have appreciated before. Uh, example, if uh, say you make an S3 request and there's a 99.99% chance that that request will work just fine. Uh, and the 0.001% chance it may not be a big factor in normal usage. But if you are loading you know, terabytes of stuff, then that 0.01% will, will come up and you need to deal uh, even with uh, that type of relatively infrequent error. Another question, where are requests assembled from data nodes? Is the client doing this? And from the same person, is the source code open? Um, it's the service nodes that determine which data nodes to, to talk to. Um, so go back to this architecture. So the client, the client just needs to know the endpoint of load balancer. And once the request winds up in the service node, the service node has uh, this deterministic algorithm that uh, lets it figure out which data nodes to talk to. So request from client to load balancer to service node, service node multiplexes to multiple data nodes, and then waits for all the data nodes to respond uh, to get back to the client. So the complexity of the service node data nodes uh, S3 partition is all hidden from the point of view of the client. If you do have a need for a source code, uh, we can work with you uh, to get an NDA uh, to give you access. And someone asking, what do I do if I want to get hands on with this tool and try it out myself? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, that's exactly uh, what we'll do next. So uh, I have a few more slides to show on that. Um, and that uh, for, okay, the flow ahead. of questions has slowed down, but of course okay. they can reach out to us later. So yep, right, okay. go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so let me go. So we were here. So what we would like is to have um, you, the audience, um, actually try this out because you know, you're you'll I'm sure you will find issues or features or some aspect that we hadn't thought about. And uh, I think the best way at this point is to have people try things out and let us know what works or doesn't. So um, what you need to do is to fill in this online license agreement. And then we will send each of you uh, your own credentials uh, to access the service. And there'll be instructions and sample Python applications. Uh, you can run clients either from your desktop, like I was doing here in the demo, or you can run them from an EC2 instance. Uh, maybe you're doing more performance critical kind of stuff. Uh, you have any HFI files, uh, you can use the HSLoad utility uh, to load the files onto the service. Uh, we do ask you to um, maybe limit the amount of data you upload to a couple of gigabytes or so. And then, uh, as I said, uh, let us know any issues and questions. And um, as they've mentioned, you know, uh, we'll be able to spend some time with each of you uh, to help you overcome any challenges you may have. Uh, this is the uh, license agreement. Uh, Laurie, maybe you could send this in the chat window uh, so people can just click on that. Yep, it's been sent in chat, so everyone can find it under the chat section. Okay, yeah, so uh, once you guys uh, have this, uh, uh, it'll come to me eventually, I will create accounts on a test instance of the server, uh, and then using those credentials, uh, we'll give you instructions to uh, how to get the, the source, uh, the demo code and samples and the tools uh, we've shown here. Alrighty. Uh, so uh, that's it for the questions. Um, I thank everyone for their time. Uh, it's been fun, and uh, I hope you guys uh, have a great time using HF Cloud. And just to clarify, we'll send out an email uh, tomorrow with a recording of this webinar, as well as some of the links that we've referenced here. So thank you, everyone, very much.